Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya al-mursaleen. Nabiyana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. May Allah azza wa jal welcome, may we welcome all of you with the peace and blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal, may Allah Azza wa Jal descend his mercy upon all of us as we come for this event seeking Laylatul Qadr, seeking Laylatul Qadr, seeking Allah Azza wa Jal's mercy, knowing that this night is better, better, not equivalent to better than a thousand months. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept from all of us that we've done so far this month and we still have some remaining time to get the full benefits of this month and in doing so, Allah's pleasure, his mercy and distance from the fire. First of all, congratulations to all of yourselves, alhamdulillah, for being here on time, being early. MashaAllah, it's the mark of a believer that they respect time. Okay, Allah swears by time. So it's a good mark of a believer that all of you are here. We've got a packed evening for yourselves, alhamdulillah. We've got lectures, we'll hear recitation of the Quran. We'll open our fast together as brothers and sisters amongst themselves. Alhamdulillah. Then we'll have our salat together in jama'ah. And then we'll pray. Salatul Isha followed by Taraweeh. Alhamdulillah. So we have a phenomenal evening planned for yourselves. Alhamdulillah. Now, what I need from yourselves, those of you who are here, is to work with me and the amazing volunteers that you see around yourselves to organize for 15,000 people. SubhanAllah, you can imagine it's not easy, but MashaAllah, the volunteers have been working tirelessly since this morning to organize this event for yourselves. So please work with them. If they tell you something, they'll come to the rows, etc. Please work with them and work with us, inshallah, to make sure that this evening goes off smoothly. Okay, alhamdulillah. This is the month of the Quran. We hear the Qur'an, we recite the Qur'an, and we try to implement the Qur'an in all that we do. So also with our events, alhamdulillah, we'd like to start by the recitation of the Qur'an, that thing through which we seek closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal. So for this, I'd like to invite up Ustad Hamza, inshallah, who will do some recitation for us to benefit from. Jazakumullah khair. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حاميم والكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه في ليلة مباركة إنا كنا منذرين فيها يفرق كل أمر حكيم أمرا من عندنا إنا كنا مرسلين رحمة من ربك إنه هو السميع العليم رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما إن كنتم موقنين لا إله إلا هو يحيي ويميت ربكم ربكم ورب آبائكم الأولين بل هم في شك يلعبون فارتقب يوم تأتي السماء بدخان مبين 
يغشى الناس هذا عذاب أليم ربنا اكشف عنا العذاب إنا مؤمنون أنا لهم الذكرى وقد جاءهم رسول مبين ثم تولوا عنه وقالوا معلم مجنون إنا كاشف العذاب قليلا إنكم عائدون يوم نبطش البطشة الكبرى إنا منتقمون Alhamdulillah. So, uh, brothers and sisters, just the, by way of setting the scene for the evening, inshallah, very shortly I'm going to invite up our first speaker for our first lecture. Uh, and that will be followed by a short segment before we have the Asr Adhan, and then we will pray together in Jama'ah. We'll pray Salatul Asr together. For our lecture now, Alhamdulillah, I would like to very shortly invite up our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Ali Hamoud, Alhamdulillah. Sheikh Ali Hamouda is going to be speaking about quite an interesting topic, man's quest for freedom. Now this is amazing, subhanAllah, when we think about it. When you speak to those who don't believe or those who don't practice Ramadan, they will always talk about how do you manage to practice Ramadan? Don't you find it restrictive? Yet is it not that Ramadan has the complete opposite effect? That it actually frees you from all of the norms and the habits that you build up. How do we tie up what's happening in Ramadan, our freedom, what's happening with Palestine all together? For this, we're going to hear from our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Ali Hamouda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa ahdahu wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'dahu wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Congratulations for making it not just to this venue, congratulations for making it to this late stage in the month of Ramadan. And there's very few things that come to an end when Ramadan finishes, one of which is your search for Laylatul Qadr. That comes to an end really when Eid arrives. But what doesn't come to an end is your search for Jannah which is the reason why you were searching for Laylatul Qadr to begin with. That search, the search for Jannah, continues until the day you die. So the real work will begin on the day of Eid onwards because that is a work ethic that is required to carry through till the day you are greeted by the angel of death. We ask Allah Almighty to give us tawfiq to maintain steadfastness from now until the end of Ramadan and from Eid until the end of our lives. Allahumma ameen. There are several values today in the 21st century that the modern man is obsessed with. Certain pursuits that define him, define her. And one of those values that the modern man is always yearning for today, more than yesterday, is the value of freedom. But I ask the question, to what extent has the modern man reach this ideal that is called liberty or freedom. With all of what man has done in recent times to reach it, with all of the uprisals and the upheavals, all of these movements that have been ignited that has affected governments and affected societies and education and families permeating to art and literature and media and rationalist ideas and modern philosophical thought all with the objective of what? Of breaking away from everything that is old and embracing everything that is new. The idea of being at liberty. We ask the question to what extent has the modern man 
actually reach this goal of being truly free. This is what I want to share with you during this evening, inshallah. First of all, I share with you a story. I think some of you may have come across it. When Amr ibn al-As, the companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was governor of Egypt, his son, the son of the authority, took part in a horse race against another Qipti, meaning a Coptic boy of Egypt. The son of the governor won the race. So he was upset, so he picked up a whip and he hit the boy relying on his father's authority, knowing that the kid would not be able to hit back. So the young Coptic boy complained to his dad and his dad was aggrieved and he traveled where? To the city of Medina in search of who? Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar radiallahu anhu, the caliph of the Muslims, in search for justice. Umar was devastated when he heard this news that a Muslim had assaulted a Coptic because he was relying on his dad's power. So, Umar ibn al-Khattab wrote a letter to Amr ibn al-As saying to him, as per what follows the moment you read this letter, you come to me, you and your son, to the city of Medina. Amr ibn al-As packs his bag, he arrives in Medina. And when all of them were now in front of Amir al muminin Umar, Amr ibn al-As, his son, the Coptic boy, and his father, Umar hands over a whip to the Coptic boy and he says to him, if you wish, you can hit the child or the kid that hit you. And so he, uh, he cashed that check and he took the whip and he began to hit the boy, hit the boy until he felt as if retribution had been delivered. He felt good. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab said to the boy, لو ضربت عمر بن العاص لما منعتك أن الغلام إنما ضربك استنادا على ملك أبيه سبحان الله عمر said to him young man if you wanted to hit his father if you wanted to hit to whip his dad عمر بن العاص the companion of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم I wouldn't have stopped you because his son only hit you relying on his authority and then Umar, he turns to the governor of Egypt, Amr ibn al-As, and he said to him those phenomenal words that you have come across. He said to him, Since when have you taken people as slaves when their mothers bore them as free? Since when have you enslaved people when their mothers delivered them with the status of freedom? The events there in Palestine, brothers and sisters, have sharpened the distinctions between things that were already quite clear, even before October 2023. The events in Palestine, the murder of Gaza, has sharpened the distinctions between the worlds of justice and injustice and sharpen the distinctions between those who pursue dunya and those who pursue the hereafter. It's made it clear. And another distinction that the events in Palestine have created, clear distinctions and drawn very clear lines between them is the worlds of enslavement and the world of those who are truly free. What does it mean to be free? Here in the West, we are told that freedom is about doing whatever your soul tells you to do. Being at the behest of your desires dictates. Doing what you want, when you want. They say, I'm free. I'm at liberty. How do the Arabs understand the concept of hurriyah or freedom? There are two usages when the Arabs describe a person as being hur meaning free, or a people as being ahrar, people who are free, or they speak about the concept of hurriya, freedom, what do they mean? Usage number one, they are referring to freedom from physical captivity. So a person who is free is a person who is not in bondage. Somebody who has the status of a free person, they are not a captive. And that is a goal that Islam holds dear and it aspires towards. 
Usage number two. When the Arabs, they say so-and-so is hur or free, they mean that this is a person who is honored with lofty characteristics and high and noble values. When they see a person who has elevated himself or herself from the base traits, the lowly characteristics, and they become men or women of bravery, courage, generosity, feeding of the guest, honoring of the family, people of virtue who stay away from what is prohibited and despicable, they look at that person and they say, that person is free. That's a new concept. That's a new understanding. So do you see how the Islamic or the Arabic understanding of freedom is quite different to how we understand it here in the West? Do whatever you want. Our understanding of freedom is very much connected with the idea of duty, connected with the idea of responsibility, connected with the idea of morality, adab, akhlaq, generosity. They say that is a person who is free. And that is why the Arabic linguist, Ibn Manzur al-Afriqi, he said, al-hurr huwa al-fi'al al-hasan. Al-hurr, meaning something that is free, it refers to doing what is fine. Doing what is fine. They say that is free. And in the feminine form, al-hurratu, with a ta' marbuta, in the feminine form, they say it means al-karimatu min al-nisa, the honorable woman. So when the Arab looks at a woman who is honorable, they say she is hurrah, she is truly free. It's a paradigm shift. And Islam aspires to achieve both of these freedoms. Freedom from physical captivity, freedom from bondage, and freedom from the lowly characteristics and elevate you and I to the heights of value, akhlaq, adab, morality, and virtue. And this is why, with this understanding of freedom, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the freest of all of Allah's creation on earth. A man who would carry himself with immense self-respect and dignity even before he became a prophet. A man who, was, who had a mind of his own, who never allowed a lobby or a government or a tribe or a society or a friend or a family member to dictate his mind, to govern his personality, to control him. He was a man who was independent in his thought independent in his personality and character. It wasn't an open check for people to write in whatever they want. He was not a man who would take the color of whatever friend he would walk with. He was a man who was truly free. And that is why he wasn't afraid to draw a line between himself and the prevalent practices in Mecca. He wasn't afraid to say, no, I don't do this. Though all of society were against him at one point. Bowing to idols was commonplace. Drinking alcohol was commonplace. Using interest, riba was commonplace. Female infanticide, burying your daughter alive, was to some extent commonplace. He wasn't afraid to say, I don't do any of this stuff, though it is the status quo of my community. Why? Because he was free. Then when Allah Jalla Jalaluhu gave him prophethood, and he became a true abd of Allah, a true worshipper of Allah, through his ubudiyah, through his worship of Allah, his freedom reached a whole new level. And he wanted to impart these meanings of freedom through Islam onto the hearts of the men and women who were around him. Why? So that they could never be conquered. So that they were immovable in their faith. So that they could never be bought with money. They couldn't be purchased with assets. They couldn't be tempted with the other's agenda. Men and women who were free, what steered them, what controlled them, what guided them was revelation and revelation alone. That is the true meaning of freedom. And I share with you three stories. The first of those stories, which demonstrates what I'm trying to describe to you. That gives you a practical example of what a free man or a free woman looks like. Take note of these stories. I think you will appreciate them. 
The first story pertains to Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu when he was walking the street once as a Khalifa, as Caliph, leader of the believers. And you know the Hayba, the awe of Umar. Devils would flee from him. And he is walking through the cities of Medina, you know, the streets of Medina, and there were a group of children running around, playing. And amongst them was a boy called Abdullah, son of Az-Zubair, Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair. And the moment these children, they saw Umar, they scurried, they ran away. It was the fear that they had of Umar. With the exception to one child, he stood his ground, he maintained his position, he didn't budge. Standing all by himself in the middle of the road, Umar was amazed when he saw this. So he approaches the young boy and he says to him, uh, how come you didn't run away with the rest of the kids? You're not scared or something? And Abdullah ibn Zubair, he said to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Lam akun ala ribatin min amri fa akhafuk, wa lam yakun al-tariqu dayiqan fa usi'u lak. Subhanallah. He said, leader of the believers, I haven't done anything wrong such that I should fear you. And the road is quite wide. I don't need to make space for you. Allahu Akbar. Umar was amazed when he saw this. He was taken aback by this young warrior speaking in this courageous way. What was it that impressed Umar? It was the sight of a young boy who was free, free from the fear of authority, particularly because his conscience was clear. The sight of freedom is impressive. That is story number one. Story number two, Hakim ibn Hizam is the name of the nephew of our mother Khadija radiallahu anha. And once when he was walking through the marketplaces, he stumbled across the robe of the king of Yemen that was being sold. The king of Yemen who was known as Dhu Yazin. And so he offered a few dinars of gold. He purchased the royal robe. He came to the city of Medina and he gifted it to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he wore it and he delivered a sermon like this wearing the robe of the king Dhu Yazin. And then he came down from the pulpit and he took it off because this is not really the dress of the Prophet ﷺ. And he clothed it to a young man called Usama ibn Zayd. Usama, son of Zayd. Who was he? The ex-adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ, an Arab African boy or a black looking child who unfortunately occupied quite a low position in the social hierarchy. He gave him the robe of Dhu Yazin. And so Hakim ibn Hizam, who bought the robe originally, he saw this young boy wearing the robe of the king of Yemen, and he said to him, Usama ibn Zayd, wearing the robe of the king of Yemen? And Usama ibn Zayd, he said, Naam, la ana wallahi khayrun min the yazin, wa la abi khayrun min abi. He said, yeah, I am wearing the robe of the king of Yemen because I am better than the king of Yemen. He said, and my dad is better than the dad of the king of Yemen. Allahu Akbar. Hakim ibn Hizam was amazed when he heard this. Why was he amazed? Because in front of him was a young man who was free. Free from all of the metrics that you and I use to measure people. Clothes and cars and homes and money and women and the rest of it. A boy who didn't believe in any of that stuff that my value comes through my piety, my taqwa, my worship to Allah, and it doesn't matter what society thinks. I am better than the king of the Yazin, and my dad is better than his dad. Allahu Akbar. Story number three I share with you, my brothers and sisters, pertains to a judge by the name of Abu Bakr al-Baqillani. He is a Ash'ari scholar who lived around 950 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina. And he was summoned to engage in a theological debate with one of the emperors of Rome, who was a Christian. The emperor of Rome is thinking to himself, how am I going to get this man to bow to me? Because it was the custom of the emperors of Rome that when you come into their royal space, you prostrate, you kiss the floor, and then you speak to the emperor. He knows that he's not going to get this from Judge Abu Bakr. So what is he to do? He said to his men, bring down the height of the door. So instead of it being seven foot high, bring it down to say 
four foot high, which means that when he comes into my space, he has to bow down, and so we get it out of him that way. So Judge Abu Bakr al-Baqillani arrives at the palace of the emperor. The emperor is told the judge has arrived, and so he establishes his throne in front of this shortened door. Judge Abu Bakr arrives, and he sees that the door has been shortened, and he understands the ploy. So what does he do? Well, he only turns 180 degrees, and I'm not going to demonstrate out of respect to you. He turns 180 degrees and gives the door his back. And then he bows down. And then he comes in in reverse, giving the king his backside. And then he stands back up facing the wall, adjusts his headgear and his clothes, and then he turns and he speaks to the king. And the king was amazed when he saw this. And he realized that these Muslims can never be enslaved. These three stories are images and narrations. I want you to remember the next time a friend or a trend or society ex expectation suggests that you should be lesser of a practicing Muslim, be a slave of us rather than being a abd of Allah. Remember these stories, load them up in your mind. Here I'm going to ask a question. What are the signs of those who are truly free? If it's still not very clear to you, despite the three stories that I have picked out for you, let us spell it out in black and white so that there is no more confusion left. What are the signs, Brother Ali, of those who are truly free so that when people talk about freedom, I say, yes, that is freedom, and no, that is slavery wearing the cloak of freedom. What are their signs? Take note, I share with you around three. The first sign of a person, a man, a woman, or a community who are truly free is that they don't hand over their minds and their personalities to be governed by others. They have minds of their own. They have a brain which they use to reason, to rationalize between right and wrong. They are accountable to Allah Almighty. He commands me, He prohibits me, and I don't give that authority to anybody else. They are people, men and women, who don't take the color of any friend that they walk with. If they're righteous, they're righteous. And if they're sinning, they're sinning. They don't do that. They are men and women who know how to say no, no, even though everyone else may be saying yes. They know how to say no and to draw the line, not out of stubbornness, not out of arrogance, not out of defiance, but to declare that they are autonomous Muslims, they are independent believers, and it is wahi revelation from Allah that steers them. Allahu Akbar. That is sign number one. Take note of sign number two of a people who are truly ahrar, truly free. They don't allow fallouts between them and another Muslim to extend unnecessarily long. Whether it's between you and a cousin, you and an ex-spouse, or you and an ex-business partner, you or a relative, you don't allow a fallout to prolong a period of silence that drags. You don't allow a relationship to be strained for so long because you're free from all of these impulses. You don't arrogantly say, he must apologize to me before I give them the apology. They must extend the olive branch before I do. You don't do that. My sister, my brother, you don't deprive an ex-spouse from access to their children and custody to their children. Why? Because you are free. You are above these impulses. You are above egoism and impatience and recklessness. You're not steered and governed by recklessness and anger and rage and pettiness and bitterness. You're free from all of that. That is a sign of a person who is free, sign number two. Sign number three of those who are truly free is that they inspire an immense level of Oh, their character, their personalities, 
their behavior, their decisions, their talk, their silence is magnetic. There is an enchanting charm to their behavior. Because Allah Almighty created you and I as free and honorable people, we recognize honor when we see it. That is sign number three. When you see those who are truly free, you are amazed. There is an irresistible pull towards them and you can't explain it, but I explain it to you, my brother, my sister. You are witnessing a man or a woman or a community who are truly free. Though it may cost them their lives, they stand by their principles and that is a spectacle that we admire. Perhaps this explains why the events in Palestine and Gaza specifically have captured the attention of the world. Maybe it was their patience. I don't think it's their patience. We've seen patience before. Maybe it's their resilience, their stubbornness, their optimism. We've seen optimism elsewhere. Maybe it's their bravery and their courage. We've seen courage elsewhere. I argue, and Allah knows best, that the secret behind how the world has been enchanted by the behavior of those patient Muslims there in Palestine goes back to this element that we're speaking of this evening. We admire freedom when we see it. And we recognize freedom when we see it. And we are drawn and pulled towards freedom when we see it. And that is what we have seen there. And that is what the world has seen. And perhaps you have come across the article in the Guardian newspaper that was titled, and I quote word for word, young Americans picking up copies of the Quran to understand Muslim Palestinian resilience. Trying to understand how is it that they behave in this way? It's costing them everything that you and I consider dear, yet it's nothing is too much to sacrifice for Allah Almighty. In short, sign number three, you will recognize a person or a community who are truly free because you are innately drawn to their behavior. Why? Because their freedom is anchored upon something very high. Their freedom is not anchored upon desire fetishes, urges, impulses. Their freedom is anchored upon the most high Allah Jalla Jalalu, and for them nothing is too much to sacrifice for him. Sean King, American journalist, another man who recognized the freedom of the people of Palestine and he decided, he decided to become like them and to embrace their religion. He credited on the first day of the month of Ramadan when he took his shahada there in America, he categorically credited his reversion to Islam to the last six months of scenes that he has seen unfolding in Gaza and the resilience of the Muslims there. He said, if it wasn't for those last six months, I don't think I would be here today. He said, not only have they opened my eyes and the eyes of my wife who are here to become Muslims, but they have opened the eyes of millions across the world as well. That is sign number three, when you see a person who is free, they garner an immense sense of awe in your heart and respect you want to be like. I conclude, brothers and sisters, by one last remark I want to share with you on this topic of freedom, Palestine, and Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, the chants of free Palestine have reverberated and permeated across every aspect of the globe. Alhamdulillah, I'm not taking a bash at this. Free Palestine, free Palestine, we say, great, we say it, no issues there. But there is a stark reality that you and I have to confront sooner or later. The reality suggests that it is only those who are free themselves who can deliver freedom to others. The Arabs, they have a maxim that says, فَاقِدُ شَيْءِ لَا يُعْطِي One who doesn't possess something can offer it to others. I can't go to a people and remove the shackles from their wrists if there are shackles restraining me. I cannot take the straight jacket off the body of a person if there is a straight jacket on me. If I am enslaved by something, then I cannot deliver freedom to others though I may chant free, free Palestine all day and all night. And that is why we have the story of Antar ibn Shaddad, the famous Arab African 
pre-Islamic poet and knight who we have immortalized in our books of literature in the Arab world. Antar ibn Shaddad was born a child who had a color that his father didn't appreciate, unfortunately. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. So his father decided to not give him his surname and to deprive him from paternity. And this broke the heart of, heart of young Antara. Until a tribe came and invaded the tribe of Antara on one evening, the tribe of Abs, and they stole all of the camels. So the father of Antar ibn Shaddad, he said to his son, Ya Antar, kur ya Antar, go and proceed, charge at them, charge, go and fight Antara. Antara said to his dad, Al Abdu la yuhsinu al karra wal far innama yuhsinu al halba wal sar. He said, Dad, slaves like us don't know how to charge and fight. We only know how to milk animals and herd sheep. So his father realized, I was the one who made him into a coward. I have deprived him from his right of paternity. I have not given him my surname. So his father knew what he needed to do. He said, Kurya antara wa anta hur. Charge antara and I will give you your freedom. So antara charged. And he fought them single-handedly in a ferocious battle and he retrieved the camels and he became Antar ibn Shaddad whom we celebrate till this day. What is the point of mentioning this story? Those who don't possess freedom can offer it to others. You and I must be free men and women before we can offer it to others. So you ask yourself now honestly, what is it that is shackling you? What is it that is limiting you? so that your activism can be effective. Think about it in the mirror of Iman. Look carefully and ask, is it something promiscuous, something haram I am browsing through the internet, perhaps even in the evenings of Ramadan? Before I can remove the shackles of others, I have to remove them from mine, from my hands. Is it perhaps a hijab, my sister, that you are still struggling with, embattled with the idea of hijab till this day? For your activism to be effective, you have to remove the shackles from yourself. Embrace your hijab before you are able to remove the shackles from others. What is it for you, my brother? Is it nicotine addiction, shisha addiction, the use of mortgaged or riba-based financial entanglements? What is it? Is it a supplier you still enslaved to? What is it? Find it. Trace it down. Is it your obsession with being liked by others that has caused you to develop multiple personalities to please them all and now you have forgot on your own who you are? Break away from these chains now once and for all and embrace your identity as a mu'min believer. Then your activism and your chance to free Palestine will be effective. Then Allah Almighty will deliver the ark of Prophet Noah to deliver us to the shore of safety. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us and to free us and to allow us to break away from all of the yokes of haram that are on our necks and our wrists and our ankles. We ask Allah Jalla Jalaluhu to liberate us from everything that is prohibited and to allow us to become truly free men and women through their ubudiyah, through the worship of Allah Almighty. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad walhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, we still have uh, an, a lecture later on from Mufti Mank, inshallah, we still have a packed evening. So for the next segment, if I can ask for them to play the video, please. Okay, everyone, settle down now. Today you'll be learning about our with a favorite teacher, of course. Let's wait for everyone to log in and we'll get started. When we first considered Reed Meta School for our child, we were unsure about the impact of online learning. Our child is thriving and showing remarkable improvements in confidence, and their academic performance has been outstanding. What sets Reed Meta School apart from me is how it leverages technology to make the learning interactive and very fun. The personal touch has made a world of difference to our child's learning. Teachers are genuinely interested in how I learn best and are always willing to adapt their methods to suit my needs. We have been really impressed with the attention and care at Reed Meta School. Claim your free trial or enroll now. Reed Meta School, the Muslim independent online school. Visit readmetaschool.com to sign up now.
السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ MashaAllah, I would like to start by congratulating you all to making it through the last 10 days of Ramadan. This month has been yours. And now I also pray that the light of power, the night of power is also yours, Laylatul Qadr, inshallah. You've got a few more nights remaining and then it will be Eid. Okay, so I am Mr. Hussein and I am an educator and I've been serving as a head teacher now for more than 10 years in Ilford. I stood here three months ago in the Excel Center and I introduced the concept of our online school to the parents and the audience. Some of them took action and Alhamdulillah since then we have changed lives. Yes, we have changed lives. And the question that I asked the parents and the audience was, and I'll ask again today, and I want you to listen to this question. Are you sending your children to a school? Are you sending your children to a school where you know their faith is being compromised? Are you sending them to a school where you know their faith is being compromised? You're not comfortable with them going there. If you are still sending them there, you are doing them a disservice. And a disservice is the politest way for me to put it. Imagine you're sending them to a school where you know they're chipping away at their iman, at their faith. They don't know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. They come home from a school day not knowing Islam. That's a disservice. Why, when we can offer a solution to this? Why, when we can offer... We are Reed Meta School, an online school, delivering an online timetable following a normal school. So from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock, the English curriculum alongside an Islamic curriculum delivered by qualified teachers. So, no longer will your children will be exposed to the exposures of the society and the regimes that are being pushed onto them. They will be in the protection and safety of their own homes. A, a mighty, so we invited children to a free trial, which I'm going to do today. I'm going to scan a QR code behind me, not yet, inshallah, and we will ask you to fill in a form. 95% of those children who had a three-day free trial, 95% of those children signed up immediately they didn't wait for the next term the next academic year they said mashallah this is the solution for us we want to sign up immediately so i'm going to put the qr code up here now i would like you to scan the qr code take a picture of the qr code i've got a lot of youth here today your brothers and sisters who are attending school do it for them scan this qr code take a picture of it fill in the form once you fill in the form this is a call for action once you fill in the form we will be in touch with you. We'll arrange a three-day free trial. After the free trial, we'll, we'll establish if it's a solution suitable for you and for us. And then, inshallah, we will take it from there. 95% of the children were happy. 95% of the children enrolled immediately. Alhamdulillah. It's a duty upon us as Muslims to protect and educate our children. And we together can, are a solution for this and can provide this for our children. Protection and education. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Okay, inshallah, we're very shortly going to hear the adhan for Salatul Asr, followed by obviously the Salat itself, and then we'll have our lecture with Mufti Menk, inshallah. Just before that, I'd like to invite a brother Nan for some messages. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Almost time to break your fast, brothers, but we do need a bit more energy from both brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. MashaAllah, much better. Uh, if I could get all of the brothers and all of the sisters to stand up for me, please, just very quickly. If everybody can stand up. Everybody stand up, please. Jazakumullah khair. Okay. Now we're trying to form the safs, the rows. So if everyone can fill any gaps that you see, whether it's to your left or to your right. In fact, move towards your right, please. Fill any gaps in front of you or to the right of you. If everyone can shuffle towards the right. Sisters, if you could move Towards the right, fill any gaps, please. Jazakumullah khair. We're going to call the adhan very shortly and we will be making the rows for the prayer.
fill any gaps. Also, once, you, once you've done that, my dear brothers and sisters, please take your seats. Jazakumullah khair. Please take your seats. Jazakumullah khair. Also, brothers and sisters, please ensure that your shoes are in the bags provided. Ensure that your bags and your belongings are not obstructing any of the pathways. We are going to be using those pathways to distribute the iftar meals. And you blocking those pathways is going to obstruct us and it's going to make it difficult for us. So please ensure that you're not doing that. Please ensure that you pay attention to all of the volunteers. Jazakumullah khair.
الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استووا سووا صفوفكم فإن تسوية الصفوف من تمام الصلاة سدوا الخلل وحاذوا بين المناكب ولينوا بأيدي إخوانكم الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سميع الله لمن حميده ربنا ولك الحمد الله أكبر 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 سمع الله لمن حميده ربنا ولك الحمد الله أكبر 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 الله أكبر
سمع الله لمن حمده ربنا ولك الحمد الله أكبر 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 سمع الله لمن حميده ربنا ولك الحمد الله أكبر 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 السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah. I think one of the interesting things about having a big screen like that whilst everyone's praying is when you finish, you can see where all the gaps are. And there are a number of gaps I noticed afterwards when people have sat down after they finished praying. There shouldn't be any gaps between yourselves, brothers and sisters, for the sisters. So there were some gaps that I noticed when it comes to the salat. Make sure there's no gaps. Fill any spaces that there are you find in front of you, to your left and right. Pull people forward. There'll be more people coming still. So make sure there's no gaps, inshallah. Also, make sure that you put your shoes in bags. The space is very tight anyway. Put your shoes in bags, inshallah, so you don't make it uncomfortable for the person standing in front of you or next to you. Everyone has bags. Please place your shoes in those bags. And you can keep them in front of you whilst you're praying. Okay. Also, sisters, to my left and to your right in that far corner, so where I'm pointing towards, 
there's lots of space. So if sisters are coming in, if you want to move across, shift across, inshallah, there's lots of space to my left and to your right in that corner. So sisters who are still coming in or sisters who are already there, if you want to shift across slightly, inshallah, to fill up that space, so there's more space for the sisters who are coming uh, late, inshallah. Okay, alhamdulillah. So we continue with our program, seeking Laylatul Qadr, seeking the night that's better than a thousand months, seeking the night in which the angels and the archangel Jibril, Jibreel alayhi salam himself descends to see who's worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, seeking Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness. So for our next segment, inshallah, I'd like to invite up for his lecture, our dear Mufti Menk. Brothers, if uh, you're not praying, if you can take a seat, please, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Mashallah. I spoke to a brother I met earlier who was a revert. He told me that I'm so happy to see so many people so serious about their faith in the month of Ramadan. And I told him, I said, my brother, do you know that we are actually a true reflection of what a Muslim should be like in the month of Ramadan? And we should be letting that extend outside the month of Ramadan. So definitely in the month of Ramadan, you will notice people who don't pray outside Ramadan as they should, praying with such dedication because it's Ramadan, mashallah. Don't you agree? You see people giving charity more in the month of Ramadan. MashaAllah. You see people who are usually very temperamental and angry calm down in the month of Ramadan. Don't you see that? MashaAllah. You might be one of them, right? I could be too. May Allah bless all of us. We see people at times who are far away from the masjid they hardly come to the masjid but they are there every night in the month of ramadan praying long prayer subhanallah you see people reciting the quran you see the music go out and the nasheeds come in you see the haram relations cut off subhanallah the only problem is some of them cut them off and say see you after 30 days inshallah the moon that is going to be cited for Eid does not depict a return to sinful behavior, but rather it is a sign of joy that Allah has given you the opportunity to engage in such dedicated worship that he wants you to be able to say, this is the moon that I've just seen. My life has actually changed forever. May Allah Almighty grant that to us. So this Ramadan, I invite you, my brothers and sisters, to continue with the dedication that you have had in Ramadan, even if it may be one notch lower in the sense that it's no longer Ramadan, but it should never be lower than that to the point where your obligations are forgotten or left out, or something forbidden creeps back into your life. That we should become considerate of. Allah says when he speaks about the fast he says in order for you to achieve taqwa what is taqwa it is the proper connection with Allah it is piety it is God consciousness it is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath and punishment so we ask Allah to strengthen all of us Ramadan is a gift that gift continues right up to the next Ramadan if you really are dedicated and this is why if you look carefully, we fast 30 days, 29 days, meaning one month. And we're dedicated. People who are engaged in haram, like I said, they quit it because of the sanctity of the month of Ramadan. 
people actually become more serious with things that they were not so serious about people who had issues dressing usually in Ramadan they are strengthened by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such that their dress code improves and here I refer to both male and female the dress code improves mashallah but my brothers and sisters, the whole idea is when you exit Ramadan, look at how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, tells you, Man saama Ramadana thumma atba'ahu sittam min shawwal kana ka siyam dahr Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan, follows it up with the six fasts of shawwal, will have a reward as though they fasted the entire year. If you look at it and you break it down numerically, you will find that Every good deed is minimum multiplied by 10. You fasted for one month, multiplied by 10 gives you a reward equivalent of 10 months of fasting. You fast six more days, you multiply that by 10, it gives you 60 days. And 60 days is two months. So 10 months plus two months gives you the reward of the entire year. However, Allah wants you to continue in that beautiful dedication. So you fasting six days of shawwal, but what is even more authentic is to fast three days every month, known as Ayyamul Bid. The 13th, 14th, and 15th of the lunar month, we are advised to fast that, multiply by 10. You get a reward of having fasted the whole month. Another thing that is absolutely authentic is the fast of the Monday and the Thursday. So if you love Ramadan and you enjoy the way Allah has kept for you a season wherein you polish yourself, then you can continue with the fast that may not be compulsory, but it will indeed polish you to a new level where I'm no longer fasting because it's an obligation, but I'm fasting because of the love of Allah. I enjoy it. I want it. I need the reward and I want to improve and polish myself such that Allah become pleased with me and I can earn paradise. Today, in order to shed a few kilos and in order to feel a little bit healthier, when the doctor tells you you should engage in intermittent fasting, we quickly do so. Intermittent fasting. I'm doing, what do they call it? The 16 or the 18, 6, isn't it? Or the 16, 8 or something of that nature where so many hours, so many hours and we do it for our health. What about your spiritual health? If Allah tells you twice a week, Monday and Thursday, you fast, you get a full reward. May Allah bless you. Forget about having known about intermittent fasting. This is something prophetic. It has something in it for you way beyond the beauty and the uprightness of your own body and health it goes beyond that to something that is unimaginable it will carry through all the way to paradise the hadith says when a person passes away many things follow that person to his grave but some things go back and what comes with the person his deeds what are the deeds i'm going to work on these deeds i want to pack away as i would with my suitcase when i'm traveling put essentials, put things that are going to help you. You want to be careful not to carry unnecessary burdens because you know if you're going by air, you're only allowed a certain number of kilos or a certain number of pieces. So I cannot take more. I will pack things, but I'm not going to go with empty bags. I need to fill that bag with something. I have a journey far more important than any other journey I'm going to undertake. And guess which journey that is? It's the journey into the hereafter. Subhanallah. What should I take with me? I'm going to take with me the goodness that I've done. Not all of us are scholars. Not all of us have capabilities to be able to teach the deen to someone. But every one of us can do goodness. You can be kind. You can reach out to others. You can stop harming people. You can talk to them with respect. You can share the little you know. We have many of us here who are seated today. Influencers on social media, mashallah. With thousands of followers, tens of thousands of followers millions of followers and tens of millions of followers subhanallah i tell you what use your platform to encourage people to do some goodness and you will never regret it on the day of judgment as you meet with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you may notice that one small deed you may have done on that social media platform that allah blessed you with actually earned you the tipping of the scale on the right side and you went into paradise may allah grant us jannah this is the last 
day or the last few days of Ramadan, right? The last few hours, let's say, of the month of Ramadan. I tell you, my beloved brothers and sisters, call out to Allah. Ask him, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah. Oh Allah, I ask you to grant me paradise. Allahumma inna ka afuun tu hibbul afwa fa'fu anni. Oh Allah, you are forgiving. You love to forgive. So forgive me. We want to achieve forgiveness. We want to really achieve something unique and amazing. When we've achieved forgiveness and we are serious about seeking that forgiveness, we will feel a change in our lives. We will feel a little bit more dedicated to prayer. We may not have been prior to Ramadan. Ramadan came because of the effort we pushed ourselves to make. The blessing of Allah is outside of Ramadan. I promise you, he will give you a push in order to fulfill the salah, tasting the sweetness of that prayer. The minute you taste the sweetness of recitation of Quran, I promise you, you will be reading it on a daily basis. People say, but I don't have time. One miracle of the Quran, which is tried and tested is when you do not have time and you make the time to read a portion of the Quran, Allah gives you even more time through your day and you wonder how come I have so much of time, but it's because you made time for Allah who is the owner and creator of time. Guess what? He spaced it out for you and blessed you in that particular time. You achieve 20 things during a time frame that you would only have achieved maybe 10 or even less. Why? Because you started your day with a recitation of the Quran, even though life might have told you, you don't have time for this. May Allah forgive us. May Allah forgive us. I can never say I don't have time for my maker because I'm going to ultimately return to him and he's going to ask me, how did you use your time? That brings me to something very important. Did I not say the last days of Ramadan? Let's take them seriously. If we were not so serious in the previous days, now is the time to become even more serious. Let's engage in worship tonight. Enjoy the acts of worship. What are the different types of worship we can engage in today? Number one, seeking forgiveness of Allah, praising Allah, remembering Allah, the adhkar, that which comes to your tongue from the words of praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declaring his glory and so on. Those are all important ways of worshiping Allah. Similarly, the pillars of Islam, we will keep on repeating our shahada. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, o la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The power of this statement is such that on the day of judgment, when it is put on a scale, it will be heavier than 99 files of sinful activity that a person engaged in. Each file is from the east to the west. There is a narration known as Hadith Al-Bitaqa, the Hadith of the card where a person will be brought on the day of judgment. And as Allah says, he's going to weigh your deeds. That's the mercy of Allah. Imagine Allah says, I'm going to weigh your deeds. You got more good deeds than bad. You go to paradise. You got more bad deeds than good. You have none other than yourself to blame. Imagine if there was no scale and every bad deed you did, you would have to go into hellfire. Allah says, no, we will forgive whomsoever we wish. If you've done more good than bad, we just look at the scale. If it's tipped on the right side, you go to Jannah, paradise because you did better. Imagine that's Allah. So keep on doing more good deeds, more good deeds, because when your deeds that are good are more than your deeds that are bad, you already have reserved your place in paradise. So the scale is such that subhanallah, we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with beautiful deeds and we come to him with so many different things. I was mentioning this hadith where a person is brought and all his sins are being weighed. His deeds are being weighed. And he has 99 files filled with sin, each file from the east to the west. And it looks like there is hopelessness, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fair and just. Once in his life, sincerely in an upright way, he uttered with firm conviction and belief that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. And you know what the hadith says, when that card where this is written is placed on the right side 
it becomes heavier than those 99 files on the other side. Surely it's an act of worship to repeat this shahada so often. Similarly, what is an act of worship is the pillars of Islam besides the Hajj, right? The Hajj, you have to do Hajj or, or you have to fulfill the pilgrimage during a specified time in the month known as Dhul Hijjah. But if you take a careful look, there is something called the minor pilgrimage or the Umrah. If Allah has given you the means in Ramadan, try to go for Umrah. As packed as it may be, there will be a space for you. There will be a space for you. Why? Because the reward of doing Umrah in Ramadan is equivalent to doing Hajj with the Prophet wasallam, according to some narration, which is authenticated by the scholars. So if you have the means, go. Don't let the crowd make you think, no, it's packed and it's packed and there are too many people. The blessings descend in a bigger way when there are more people. This evening we are here to worship Allah together. Thousands of us, approximately 15,000 of us. What do you think we're going to achieve? We're all going to be begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us, to alleviate the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Palestine, to grant them victory and protection. That is the main core of our dua tonight. May Allah accept it from us. My brothers and sisters, we are bleeding because they're bleeding and we cannot sleep in a sound manner because they are struggling and suffering. May Allah Almighty grant ease to them and may Allah alleviate their struggles and suffering. May Allah grant them victory and may Allah open their doors. Ameen. So another act of worship, like I said, the Shahada is a pillar of Islam. It is a pillar of Islam. You don't just say it in order to enter the fold of Islam and that's it. But you repeat it on a daily basis. In fact, in your prayer, in your salah, every group or every set of units of prayer, there is an Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. You have to say that. That is your shahada. You say that in every salah. So it's a pillar of Islam in another pillar of Islam known as salah. And therefore, we engage in voluntary prayer on a day like this, a night like this. We engage in a voluntary prayer in sets of twos, taraweeh or qiyam. Qiyam generally refers to standing at night in prayer. The tahajjud is the late night prayer and the taraweeh is the early night prayer. In these nights, we do both of them to the best of our ability. Yes, one might argue it's not compulsory. I know that. But why would I not engage in something? It's not compulsory, but I'm going to get a reward that is multiplied in a fashion, in a manner that is unlike any other time of the year. Let me do it for the sake of Allah. If I'm going to read Quran in Ramadan, in the condition of fasting or in the nights that are considered the most blessed nights of the entire year, why wouldn't I pick the Quran up and read a little bit and see the multiplication of the reward pack away as many deeds to be placed on that scale on the day of judgment. And when Allah knows it was quite difficult for me to do that, he's going to reward me based on my intention with my circumstance. When we see one another, what do we see? We see different types of people. Some have beards, some don't, some in hijab, some not in hijab, some this way, some that way. Everyone has their own struggles. You don't know what someone has done and how far they've gotten and where they've come. But Allah knows the struggles. Allah knows your circumstances. Allah knows your, your condition. And therefore Allah will reward you uniquely based on a combination of everything put together for you. Your reward may be higher than someone who outwardly might be seeming to be more practicing because Allah knows your struggle is real. They moved from 90% to 91% in one year. And you moved from 50 to 80 in one year. You're still behind them, but your movement, Allah knows it. He knows how much you've done. Therefore, never allow the statements of another human being to make you feel that that has some form of connection with what Allah thinks about you. No way. No way. May Allah Almighty forgive us. We have charity, which is a pillar of Islam. Islam is the only religion, and I've said this many times in the past, that makes it a pillar of faith to share what you have with those who do not have it if you have beyond a certain point. The only religion that makes it a pillar of faith for you 
to share what you have with those who don't have it if you have beyond a certain point and that is your zakat so this zakat you give it you can give it in ramadan you can give it out of ramadan but if you were to give beyond zakat something beyond just the two percent two and a half percent something beyond that then allah will reward you immensely so much of reward give Unfiq ya ibna adama unfiq alayk a secret to earn is to release allahu akbar did you know that a secret to earn is to give the hadith qudsi says allah almighty says o son of adam spend give and i will spend on you i will give you you want if you want what has allah given you already well take from it and give it to those who don't have and notice how allah will shower it on you subhanallah because Allah's quality of giving is the ultimate giving. Your quality of giving is actually so small. What are you going to give? You're only going to give a portion of what Allah gave you. But the same Allah gave everyone. Do you know when there is a cause? When there is a cause that, that requires funding, for example, don't think that that cause is going to stop just because I didn't give. Allah puts it in people's hearts to give. And Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can fulfill it without anyone giving by creating a miracle for them. How many of us, we don't depend on anyone besides Allah. He opened doors of some form of business that we never imagined would happen. That was Allah. How did he do it? He didn't allow you to stretch your hand to anyone else. That's why the dua of the Prophet sallallahu that I want to teach you this evening. Where the Prophet sallallahu asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him from haram by giving him sufficiency in halal and the same we would ask allahumma kfini bi halalika an haramik oh allah grant me such sufficiency in halal that i am protected from haram make me happy quench my desire through halal in a way that i do not go towards haram what a powerful dua ask allah that he will give it to you allahumma kfini bi halalika an haramik Oh Allah, protect me from haram by giving me the quenching of my desire through the halal. May Allah grant that to us. You make that dua, even marriage becomes easy because Allah gives you halal in to fulfill your base desires, which is something natural by the way. May Allah Almighty help us to do the right thing all the time. And the dua continues. Waghnini bifadlika amman siwak. Oh Allah, make me independent. Grant me richness from you. Make me independent through your virtue in a way that I depend on none other than you. Oh Allah, grant me independence, meaning grant me sustenance, grant me independence through your virtue, through your gift and your favor in a way that I never depend on anyone but you, O oh Allah. Ask Allah that and see what Allah does. So the point I'm raising is on a day like this and at night like this, give. Even if it is a pound, a dollar, two, five, ten, depending on your capacity, whatever you can. And wallahi, if you do it with the right intention, you will notice within a short span of time, Allah multiply your wealth. Nobody's wealth has ever become depleted because of a charity they gave. If anything, it was multiplied by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant that to us. So we have the prayer. We have the shahada, we have the zakah, and guess what? We are fasting. These are pillars of Islam. We are fasting. The fasting of Ramadan is compulsory. Yes, there are a few exceptions, those who are unwell and those who are traveling. If you are not well, that's the only time a fast outside Ramadan will be equal in reward to the fast that is in Ramadan. When you have not been able to do it for a valid excuse, the sisters on their monthly cycle, when they don't fast in Ramadan and they happen to make it up after Ramadan, that's the only time that you making a fast outside Ramadan and you getting a reward as though you fasted in Ramadan. Allah will not decrease your reward because you had an excuse or you weren't allowed to actually fast. Allah gave you a, such a discount that he said, I don't want you to fast. I want you to concentrate on other things. May Allah Almighty protect all of us. And this is why even a person on a journey, look at how Allah says to us, giving us a leeway and telling us, if you're on a journey, you can make it up on another day. 
ليس من البر الصيام في السفر according to a hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says there is no righteousness it's not from righteousness to fast while you are traveling what this means is when you know that you are traveling you have an option to fast or not to fast and both are equal don't think that if i'm going to struggle and suffer while i'm traveling and i'm going to fast because i'm traveling then my reward is going to be more because i'm righteous allah says there's no righteousness you can fast or you don't have to fast it's the same because you're a traveler you're traveling yeah, and you make it up after ramadan it's not a discount like i'm not going to be making this up because i'm traveling no you're traveling one brother comes to me and tells me you know sometimes when you learn a little bit and you haven't learned a bit more you tend to become confused when you're confused please ask those with knowledge he says i read a hadith saying we're all travelers on earth that means i have a discount all the time i said well if that was the case we would be reading shorter salah all the time and hardly anyone would be fasting because when are you going to make it up perhaps in jahannam may allah forgive us that's such a wrong idea such a wrong idea i told him brother i hope you're just joking he says well i'm just looking for a way out i said don't a true believer looks for a way in not a way out i want to know how can i fast in a proper way what should i do what shouldn't i do the other day someone told me do you know what we allow 10 minutes more in case in case perhaps maybe the timing might be a little bit wrong you know so we give a leeway of about 10 minutes i said my brother 10 minutes is too much because when allah tells you eat now you can't say well the sheikh at my masjid told me i can't i gotta wait for 10 more minutes you can't do that Allah says, eat now, the sun has set, it's over, you eat now. Whether the sheikh in your masjid says, wait for a minute or not, that's not going to be an answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I tell those who make up these calendars, you know the calendars made by a human being, the timetables, I say, my brother, don't give leeways because Allah, Allah said, this is the minute, this is the minute. You can't come up and say, but I know a little bit better, I'm going to give one more minute, just in case. Allah knows the just in cases, subhanallah. You stick to what Allah has said and inshallah you are right. May Allah Almighty help us and grant us goodness. You follow what I'm saying? So my beloved brothers and sisters, outside of Ramadan, we're going to fast. In Ramadan, we're going to try and engage in all these beautiful acts of worship. Guess what? I've already overshot my time. But nonetheless, these are just few words of encouragement. Look, my brothers and sisters, cry to Allah, beg him. To meet your needs but while you're doing that don't be selfish don't just ask about yourselves i told you earlier tonight we're dedicating it to our brothers and sisters in gaza and we're going to pray for them and ask allah to help them to grant them victory and goodness and success and indeed our problems and issues while we do have them they are diminished in the face of the problems that they have out there and in other countries and other places where our brothers and sisters are struggling some we know some we don't know some we may never know but trust me when you are more concerned about others your problems are diminished if you have issues one of the ways of Helping yourself is go and volunteer with a charity and go and help people with bigger issues than yours. And you start realizing, Wallahi, I've got no problem. I've got nothing. Whatever I have is actually a blessing of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because then we compare our lives with those who are in a far worse situation than ours. That's what Ramadan is all about. To change yourself, to change the way you look at things, to become compassionate, to reach out to others, to change your life, to connect with Allah to be interested in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. When a lie is said about someone, it spreads very quickly, but it's our duty to find out the truth, which takes a little bit more time and you need to make a bigger effort. May Allah Almighty use us to find out always what the truth is and then to follow it. And may Allah bless all of us. I really would like to welcome you all this evening. And I really would like to ask Allah Almighty to make it a successful evening where we all enjoy the great act of worship known as iftar together and we pray for one another and we feel the love for one another and we may allah almighty grant us forgiveness before we get up from our places this evening ameen aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina muhammad Alhamdulillah, so many messages there for all of us wherever we are on the plane of practicing, Alhamdulillah. 
Um, Mufti is still here. He's going to be leading us in Salah. He's going to have uh, iftar with us. And so, inshallah, we'll hear from him again. Um, for the next segment, inshallah, alhamdulillah, as you've heard from the various speakers, we can't ignore what's happening in Gaza, what's happening to our brothers and sisters, and the, our partners in this human appeal, alhamdulillah, they've gone out and done a lot of work in this space. So we're going to have an update now, inshallah, which I'd like to invite our brother Rahim Jang. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa Allah. Wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. To the believers, to the Muslims of London, at a time of war, we greet you with peace. My brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum. Three British aid workers, three were killed last week. And the world now condemns the atrocities in Gaza, as they should. The lives of three innocent people are as if we have murdered the whole world, no matter who they are. But why? Why three Brits before people speak out? The hypocrisy that 40,000 of our brothers and sisters have been slaughtered and they ignore and they make excuses and they turn away. Be in no doubt, this is for Gaza. This is for Gaza. Today, the Muslims of London stand for Gaza. Takbir! Let them hear it, my brothers and sisters. Takbir! We have to be careful with our words. Because when we say anything, they accuse us of anti-Semitism. They accuse us of racism. So we won't use our words. We won't use the words of Iman Channel. We won't use the words of Brother Rahim. We won't use the words of Human Appeal. Let us use the words of the United Nations, who last week, their special rapporteur, a woman, an expert in human rights, a senior lawyer on the world stage, reported back to the General Assembly of the United, United Nations. What did she say about Israel? Israel is committing apartheid at the highest level, she said this. Israel is committing ethnic cleansing. She said they wish to rid Palestine of Palestinians. And the greatest crime that can be leveled at any nation not the words of Rahim, not the words of Human Appeal, not the words of Iman Channel. The words of the United Nations. Israel is accused of genocide. The deliberate and intentional slaughter and elimination of a race based upon their ethnicity. We, my brothers and sisters, are here for the people of Gaza. And today, as our Sheikh, as our beloved Mufti, may Allah bless him and give him Jannah, say Ameen. As our Sheikh advised, we have to give for the sake of Allah. And before I ask anyone to raise their hands, let me dispel a myth. The propaganda against the people of Gaza is sophisticated. The propaganda against the Palestinians is calculated. 
for when they tell us in the mainstream media. Do we believe the mainstream media? When they tell us in the mainstream media that no aid is entering into Gaza, what effect does that have on the hearts of the Ummah? What effect does that have on the hearts of the people in this room? No aid is entering into Gaza. It demotivates the Ummah. It demoralizes the Ummah. Wallahi with Allah as my witness, thousands and thousands and thousands of lorries with tens and hundreds of thousands of trucks of aid are entering into Gaza. I have the figures here in front of me, not my figures from the United Nations Anwara, who share with NGOs, who share with charity workers and their partners. I can tell you, brothers and sisters, the exact number of lorries up until today, 19,679 lorries of aid have entered into Gaza. I can tell you since the beginning of Ramadan, nearly 2,000 lorries of aid have entered into Gaza. Wallahi, I can tell you every single day how many lorries enter, what is on those lorries. So don't believe the hype. When we donate, we are feeding the women in Gaza. We are feeding our brothers in Gaza. We are feeding the orphans in Gaza. And I want you to look, if I can ask our producers to show an image of what I can see 15,000 people. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, this is how many children have been murdered in Gaza. Look at your screen. This is how many children have been murdered in Gaza. Murdered. Today, my brothers and sisters, Wallahi, we are feeding them and we are providing and I will show you the figures. This first slide will show you that since the beginning of this conflict, since the beginning of this massacre, if we can get the first slide, please. Over one million people we have reached directly with your aid. If you were at light upon light on the 1st and 2nd of January, this is your donations. Anyone who has donated to us, these are your donations reaching one million people in Gaza. I can tell you since Ramadan, and get this my brothers and sisters, with the horror, with the bombs, with the war, with the destruction of masjids, with no homes to sleep in, the people of Gaza are fasting. They are not making excuses, they are keeping and holding their fasts. We have provided by Allah's mercy 418,784 hot meals to the fasting people of Gaza this Ramadan. We can break those figures down. Look at your screen. 15,000 in northern Gaza. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, our partners take their lives in their hands to deliver these meals. You've seen what happens to aid workers in Gaza. You know that they are a target. Our brothers and sisters to deliver those meals in northern Gaza have taken their lives in their hands. 295,000 meals in Deir al-Bala in central Gaza. And in Rafa, 108,000 hot meals. This is all since the beginning of Ramadan. Every day, 300,000 liters of water. You will see the image of our desalination plant. Alhamdulillah, not destroyed by the mercy of Allah. May Allah preserve it. Say Ameen. 300,000 liters of diseased, toxic water can be purified in this plant. And every day, those figures that you see, one million something, 400 something thousand, these are people, 
every one of them has a story, every one of them has hope, every one of them is known to Allah by his name, by her name. And we wept when we received this picture, this picture of this young boy that you see on your screen now, drinking the water that you have provided when the oppressors have poisoned the water, when the oppressors have destroyed access to water. Wallahi, we are providing water to the people of Gaza in their moment of need. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, we will ask you to raise your hands. And I have a question for you. Will we ever see another odd night of Ramadan? This night was mentioned on the lips of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This night. When he was asked by his beloved companions, Ya Rasulullah, where, where will we find Laylatul Qadr? Where, Ya Rasulullah? He said, search for it on the 27th, on the 29th, and on the 25th of Ramadan. 27th and 25th are gone. The Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mentioned this night. Will we ever see another odd night of Ramadan again? How many janazas have you been to since last Ramadan? How many young people have you heard have not made it to this Ramadan? We don't have any guarantee, no one, that we will ever see another odd night of Ramadan. A night, wallahi, where the help we give to Gaza could be the reason for Allah to forgive every sin we ever committed. This, insha'Allah, is that night. I'm going to show you a film. It is not even one minute long. The people of Gaza, their courage, their iman, has inspired the ummah. I don't believe there's one person in this room that hasn't wept that hasn't praised Allah, that hasn't admired the people of Gaza and their Iman and their courage. I'm going to show you a 13-year-old girl with the courage of a lion. Wallahi, the courage of a lion in the heart of this 13-year-old girl. Because she is faced with the greatest fear of any human being. You read survey after survey when they petition people. What is your greatest fear? Everyone will answer the same thing. Being buried while I am alive. I am crushed. I'm suffocating. But I am alive and I am being buried. This is our greatest fear. This girl, and you won't see anything gruesome. You will hear her voice, the voice of a lion calling from underneath the rubble. Courage, my brothers and sisters. Wallahi, we, we have to find courage. Those who wish to ethnically cleanse Palestine have long plans. If we give up, we have no hope. The people of Gaza need us to find courage now to support them. And we will ask you, my brothers and sisters, to donate any amount that you can. Any amount you can tonight. Wallahi, we are delivering your aid. But we will start at the highest amount as we always do and see, is there a brother or a sister, a family or a businessman today who can give 2,000 pounds a month over the next year for Gaza? 24,000 pounds. My brothers and sisters, if you are one of those people, look around this room. 99.9% .9 of the Muslims in this room can never give that amount in sadaqah. Never. But some of us, some of us, Allah blessed with the ability to earn this reward, more reward, and the companions were jealous of those who could give large amounts in sadaqah. And we will come down to amounts that everyone can donate. 
everyone who wishes to feed, to give medicine, to give water, to give shelter to our brothers and sisters in Gaza. On this day, everyone will be able to donate. But we will start looking for lions in this ummah, looking for those who will find courage and give away their wealth on this night for the sake of Allah. Watch this girl. Her name, don't forget it. Her name is Alma. Say her name. Her name is Alma. She is 13 years old. This is courage. This is the people of Gaza. Indomini Alma. طب عايشين يا ألما معاك؟ ايش يا ألما؟ This 13 year old girl. Can we bring the slide, please? Can we bring the screenshot? This 13 year old girl, look at her words. Not my father who is my protector, don't save him first. Not my grandparents who I run to when I feel scared, don't save, don't save me first. Save them, save my father, save my grandparents, save my brothers and sisters. We have seen this film for four months and we didn't know who Alma was and we tracked her down, my brothers and sisters. If you were here, light upon light in January, you saw this video, we only knew her voice. Now we know her face. This lion of the ummah, this is Alma. 13 years old, with her one-year-old brother, Tarazan, trapped under the rubble. Save my brother first, she said. This is Alma. You will see her with her sister and her brother Ghanim and Rahab taken last July, this photograph. That is Alma in the corner of the screen. This is Alma, July in her summer holidays last year. Imagine what did you do on your summer holiday last year? This is Alma with her cousins, centre back. My brothers and sisters, when she said rescue them first, she was talking about her cousins in that building. All of them you see in this picture were massacred. When she said rescue them first, she was talking about her brother and sister. All of them massacred. When she said rescue them first, she was talking of her baby brother, one years old, decapitated, murdered. All of them murdered. Alma is the only one who survived. She is the only one who survived. And today, she is in a camp, in a tent, in Rafa, trying to rebuild her life with courage, with bravery, with Iman. Where is the Ummah? We will never win without courage, my brothers and sisters. So where is our first hand today? Light your torch, our first hand, at 24,000 pounds. Takbir! Do we have a second hand at 24,000 pounds? 2,000 pounds a month, my brothers and sisters, on a night, a night that we can never compare, a night that could wipe away all of our sins, every sin we have ever committed on these nights. We have a first hand at 24,000 pounds. And my brother or sister, family, if you have that ability, I say again, Virtually no one in this room can give like that to Gaza. Though thousands and thousands in here wish that they could give like that to Gaza. They wish that Allah had given them that wealth. But they haven't. Only a handful of us are able to do this and earn that reward. Do we have a second hand? Light your torches, inshallah. Shine and wave at me. A second hand here today at 24 thousand pounds from our brothers from our sisters do we have a second hand and we will move it down 
we will move down to amounts that everybody can donate for Gaza. But wallahi, we need the lions, we need the courage, we need the bravery for the people of Gaza. Do we have a second hand in the room at 24,000 pounds? We have a second hand at 24,000 pounds. Takbir! Allahu Akbar. Do we have a third hand? Do we have a third hand? And if you have your torch on just to film, please wave the torch if you are waving that it is a donation, inshallah. Do we have a third hand? My last ask, my brothers and sisters, one more of our ummah to stand at 24,000. And I ask you this, if you have that ability, I'm not asking you to show blind faith. I am asking you to look at your own lived experience. Every Muslim in this room, look at your own lived experience. What happened when you gave sadaqah last time? What happened when you gave for the sake of Allah? What happened when you gave away your wealth? Did Allah let you down? Never. Allah always replaced our wealth. These are the tests. My last ask, do we have a third hand? A third hand at 24,000 pounds in the room today. A third hand, my brothers and sisters. Takbir! Allahu Akbar. We will move it down. We will move it down. As these hours of Ramadan leave us, Ramadan is the month of Quran. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Indeed, it was revealed in these nights. So let us look at the Quran for our inspiration, my brothers and sisters. We ask, are there people here today that can donate 10,000 pounds? This is 800 pounds a month, 200 pounds a week from your business, from your savings, from your investments, 200 pounds a week, 10,000 pounds before anyone raises their hand. Let us look to the book of Allah. Wallahi, Ramadan is about the Quran. What does Allah say in his book about these moments? about when we see our brothers and sisters being slaughtered. What does Allah say in his book? Let us see the verse from Surah An-Nisa. My brothers and sisters, look at your screens. This is our Lord. This is our Lord asking us a question. Check your phones, check your Quran app. This is the accurate translation. Allah says, what is wrong with you? Not me saying it. Allah is speaking to me, to all of us. Why are we afraid? Do we not believe in the provision of Allah? He's saying, what is wrong? That you do not struggle for the sake of Allah. For whom? Who is Allah talking about? He says for the helpless, from the men, from the women and the children. Does this ring a bell? Does this sound like Allah is talking about someone? The helpless men, women and children. Allah is more specific. He goes on to say, they are crying out. Crying out. What are they crying? Wallahi, the people of Gaza are crying. Our Lord, save us from this land of oppressors. Ya Rab, save us from this land of oppressors. This is what the people of Gaza are screaming. And Allah is saying, what is wrong with us? Why will we not respond? What are we afraid of? In this last line, Allah says that they ask, Ya Rab, from your mercy, from your mercy, Ya Allah, send please, send protectors and helpers. 
That means that we are the answer to the people's du'as in Gaza. When they scream to their Lord to send help and protection, we are answering the cries of the people of Gaza. We are responding to the words they are calling to Allah. But it takes Iman 10,000 pounds. Do we have a first hand here today at 10,000 pounds? We had three. We have a first hand here at 10,000. Do we have a second hand? A second, a third hand at 10,000. A fourth hand at 10,000 pounds. Do we have a fifth hand at 10,000 pounds? Raise your torch. Wave your torch, inshallah. Do we have a fifth hand here at 10,000 pounds? We have a fifth hand, brothers and sisters, for Gaza. Free, free. Free, free. Allahu Akbar. Do we have anybody else at 10,000? And wallahi, we will move down. But we can never go wrong if we make a deal with Allah. We can never, ever go wrong. Miracles come with our sadaqah. Shifa comes with our sadaqah. Forgiveness comes with our sadaqah. Peace and tranquility. Avoidance of musibah and fitna. Everything we make dua for in Laylatul Qadr is linked to our sadaqah and push.